It was a character-driven story that pushed the envelope, attempting to mature with an aging audience, meant to settle narrative arcs that had been building up for years, establish a new status quo for the future, and act as a bridge to the next chapter of the franchise and the company. Which, technically it was, but not the way its creators had intended. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of G.I. Joe the movie. Thank you to 80stees.com for sponsoring this video. Click the link in the description below and use code TOYGALAXY to get 30% off your order today. 80stees.com started off as the source for t-shirts inspired by all things pop culture from the 1980s, but there's more to the 80s than just the 80s. They've got shirts inspired by the 70s, the decade that paved the way for the 80s. They've got shirts inspired by the 90s, the decade that carried on the legacy of the 80s. They've got shirts inspired by the 2000s, because the 80s isn't just a decade, it's a state of mind. Whether your interests are laser-focused on one thing, say, movies, there's plenty of choices from Jaws to Shaun of the Dead. If your interests bounce around, they've got shirts from cartoons to video games, superheroes to music and wrestling. From Transformers to Dungeons and Dragons, Gollum to Ron Burgundy, Darkwing Duck to Powerpuff Girls, you'll find something you love. Click the link below and use code TOYGALAXY for 30% off your order today. Again, that's code TOYGALAXY for 30% off your order. Thanks again to 80stees.com. G.I. Joe the Movie is an animated feature film released direct to television and home video in April of 1987. It was the dramatic climax of a franchise that had grown every year since it began in 1982, but still wasn't strong enough to defeat the combined forces of the Transformers and My Little Pony. Cobra, a ruthless terrorist organization determined to rule the world, has once again been thwarted by G.I. Joe, a daring, highly trained special mission force whose sole purpose is to defend human freedom, causing a crisis of confidence in leadership at Cobra. Who will lead them, Cobra Command? Commander or Serpentor. Before they can settle it amongst themselves, a mysterious intruder presents Serpentor with a new mission, steal the broadcast energy transmitter from G.I. Joe and use it to fulfill his destiny as the true leader of Cobra, conquer Earth, and finally defeat G.I. Joe. It's a mission that will finally reveal Cobra Law, the vast secret society behind the existence of Cobra and its longtime leader, Cobra Commander. Cobra Lai, civilization of snake people and bug monsters that has been in hiding for over 40,000 years, a people whose time has come to strike back, reclaiming the earth that was taken from them by the violence of the Ice Age and the evolution of humans. Can G.I. Joe overcome the self-inflicted wounds in time to defeat the snakes once and for all at the very place they originated? Or is this humanity's last gasp as Cobra finally gets their revenge? G.I. Joe was born in 1963 when Hasbro borrowed the Barbie sales model from Mattel and used it for a boy's toy. Sell a core 12-inch modern soldier figure and supplement it with various outfits. Uh, military accessories. It's not a doll, it's an action figure. For 10 years, G.I. Joe carried the banner for boys' toys at Hasbro, but nothing lasts forever and kids are notoriously fickle. And not for nothing, but by the mid-70s, the toy market was experiencing terrestrial war fatigue. G.I. Joe found himself as less a soldier, more an adventurer, and in 1975, after Hasbro neglected to secure the rights to the popular television series Six Million Dollar Man, G.I. Joe found himself hanging out with superheroes like Mike Power the Atomic Man and Bullet Man. G.I. Joe was decommissioned in 1976, but brought back the very next year in 1977 as the eight and a half inch electric power Super Joe, fighting in space against the evil forces of Gore, King of the Terrans. But as powerful as he was, Joe was no match for the arrival of Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader just a few months later. Star Wars lit the pop culture world on fire in 1977, and as a result, changed everything about the toy industry when Kenner's Star Wars action figures hit shelves in 1978. Every existing action figure line had to evolve or die for G.I. Joe, that meant taking a few years off to figure out who he wanted to be. After seeing the success Kenner had with Star Wars action figures, vehicles, and playsets, Hasbro met them on the battlefield of play in 1982. Matching Kenner's offerings with three and three quarter inch figures, vehicles, and playsets of their own, Hasbro projected 12 to 15 million dollars in sales for that first year. They ended up doing 50 million dollars. G.I. Joe didn't have a blockbuster movie like Star Wars to get kids excited and explain the mythology. Instead, sales of the new G.I. Joe line were driven by a revolutionary marketing partnership between Hasbro and Marvel Comics. Hasbro made the toys while Marvel Comics developed the mythology. And it was those comics that paved the way for G.I. Joe's adventures on television. See, 
The laws that limited what advertisers could do to promote toys on television didn't apply to comic books. Therefore, Hasbro and Marvel were able to produce 30-second animated shorts to promote the comic books that got the characters' vehicles and mythology on TV in front of kids with all the dazzling action that only TV could deliver. Those animated shorts also proved that there was a market for something bigger on television. G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero first aired in September of 1983 as a five-episode miniseries. It was followed by a second miniseries in September of 1984, and then a full 55-episode syndicated series in September of 1985. It was a novel way to advance the story of G.I. Joe's fight against Cobra and also to constantly feature new figures, vehicles, and playsets being created at Hasbro. Three years into the line, G.I. Joe was one of the most popular cartoons on television, one of the most popular toy lines, and one of the most popular comic books at Marvel. A second season was practically guaranteed for 1986. But what else was there for G.I. Joe to conquer? In 1985, toys expanded into movie theaters, Mattel's Masters of the Universe with Secret of the Sword, and Rainbow Bright with Rainbow Bright and the Star Stealer. However, neither of those did as well as the Care Bears. Produced by Nelvana, the Care Bears movie set a box office standard that every other toy company wanted to emulate. On a production budget of around $2 million, they raked in $34 million. They demonstrated the viability of the theater as another revenue source and driver of toy sales. The Care Bears movie partnered with Kenner Toys, Pizza Hut, and Trix Cereal because it wasn't just the film itself, it was all the ancillary licensing and promotional tie-ins that kept the brand front of mind and the toys ringing the registers. Movie theaters at the time had very little programming for one of the largest potential audience demographics, six-year-olds. The previously exclusive domain of the mighty Walt Disney Studios had all but been abandoned as Disney contemplated closing their animation department completely. Since 1977, Disney had only released two new animated features, 1981's The Fox and the Hound, a rough watch, and 1985's The Black Cauldron, a box office travesty, a movie that famously cost Disney $44 million to make $22 million. The Care Bears movie showed that there was money to be made for anyone who wanted to step up with an animated feature. Hasbro answered that call by partnering with the fledgling De Laurentiis Entertainment Group as a distributor for a slate of three movies based on their most popular franchises, My Little Pony, The Transformers, and G.I. Joe. Season 2 of G.I. Joe A Real American Hero began in September of 1986, shaking up the status quo at Cobra by introducing a new Cobra Emperor, Serpentor. According to Sunbow writer and story editor Buzz Dixon, the creation and inclusion of Serpentor was a surprise. Let's see. After four years of action figures, comics, and cartoons, Hasbro was tired of Cobra Commander and wanted to bring in a new, more spectacular villain, so they designed a Cobra Emperor. Snake hat and everything. When Dixon asked, where did this Cobra Emperor come from, Hasbro replied, He's always been there. While Hasbro tried to find a better name than King Cobra, Dixon tried to figure out how to incorporate him. He came up with two ideas for the new character's origin. One, fed up with Cobra Commander's incompetence, this guy was Frankenstein together by Dr. Mindbender from the DNA of a bunch of history's greatest military minds. Or, two, there's a vast secret empire that has been supporting Cobra this entire time that no one but Cobra Commander knew about. Idea number one, Frankenstein, was the idea that Dixon thought was superior, but he made the tactical mistake of making both concepts interesting. Hasbro picked both. Dixon now not only had to reconcile the new Emperor being a part of the G.I. Joe mythology at all, but also the two new origin concepts. He picked the Himalayan mountains as a place that they could have been hiding in all this time, later admitting that he might have been influenced by John Carpenter's The Thing and that the Amazon Basin would have been more appropriate for a 40,000-year-old snake society. In his notes, he called it Cobra Law as a placeholder, calling back to James Hilton's 1933 novel Lost Horizon, wherein a fictional utopia called Shangri-La exists deep in the mountains of China. But Cobra Law, that name wasn't... It's not... That's not final or anything. That's a terrible name, and there's... There's no way... Oh, okay, Hasbro loves it and wants to keep it. Because... Back at Hasbro, conversations were taking place with marketing executives from Griffin Book Hall and producers at Sunbow Animation about the reality of producing a G.I. Joe movie, a feature-length war movie for 10-year-old kids. It was suggested that, perhaps, the movie and Serpentor's origin could be used to soften the military concept and push it more science fiction fantasy, so that the war themes were less reality-based and far more acceptable to toy-buying parents. Ultimately, the movie introduced the idea that Cobra Law was the origin point of everything related to Cobra as an organization. Cobra Commander had once lived there and worked as a scientist whose face was disfigured in an accident. 
It was Cobra La who implanted the idea of creating Serpentor in Dr. Mindbender's head. Cobra La who had pulled the strings and was now pulling rank. Because not only was there someone above Cobra Commander, but there was someone above Serpentor. Globulus, the supreme ruler of Cobra La. Bearing Cobra Commander no longer has the ability to lead, Destro and Dr. Mindbender comb the tombs of the most evil leaders in history, and from their genetic tissues produce a composite clone, the ultimate Cobra Emperor, Serpentor. Introducing Serpentor, the ultimate Cobra Emperor. Serpentor! Serpentor! The most evil foe of G.I. Joe! G.I. Joe! Cobra! Cobra Emperor comes with air chariot. A product like G.I. Joe is the work of teams of people, writers, designers, executives, salespeople. Ideas can come from the top and the bottom of the production chart. Credit can be difficult to properly assign when everything is said and done. Ron Friedman had written the 1983 and 1984 G.I. Joe miniseries, as well as Arise, Serpentor Arise, the miniseries that kicked off season two. He was also writing The Transformers, the movie. Ron Friedman is listed as the writer of the G.I. Joe movie, while Buzz Dixon is credited as the story consultant. In a 2016 interview on ToddMathy.com, Dixon explains, quote, Ron Friedman had taken a crack at the first Joe screenplay, but Hasbro was not satisfied with the result. This is no slam against Friedman, who is a terrific writer and has a list of impressive credits, but he just never seemed to fully grasp the military mindset needed for the show. I remember reading through that script, though I can't remember a thing about it now, and the only thing I thought was salvageable from it was Nemesis Enforcer, end quote. Dixon says he tossed Friedman's script and wrote a whole new script centering the narrative on character and specifically a theme of redemption. The redemption of all Cobra Commander's failures, the redemption of Falcon's poor judgment as he learns what it means to be a Joe, the redemption of a brand that was dismissed by so many as nothing more than a daily 22 minute commercial for toys. This was to be the final battle between Cobra and G.I. Joe as it had existed since 1983, simultaneously bringing closure to what came before and charting a path to what could lie ahead. Hasbro was using these movies as a way to refresh their brands, cycle out old characters, introduce new characters, keep the product moving while maintaining story engagement. Hasbro had already designed toys for new characters like Nemesis Enforcer and Golobulus, Law and Order, Tunnel Rat, Chuckles, Jinx, and Falcon. They were the future of the franchise, not the characters introduced in 1982 or 1983 that kids had known their entire lives, not Cobra Commander, not Duke. For the movie, Dixon was given permission to do something that had never been done on the G.I. Joe cartoon. Something to raise the stakes and emotional weight of the movie. Something to push the drama to the next level to try to keep those older kids engaged. Hasbro gave Dixon permission to kill a Joe. It would get them that PG rating they were looking for, and it was decided that new Joe recruit Falcon was going to have a familial connection to the Joes. Something that would explain why he could be on the team after a record of poor performance. Initially, Falcon was going to be Hawk's son, carrying on the bird-themed call signs. That was changed to Duke's half-brother. Duke was putting his career and his life on the line to protect his brother, a promise he made to their mom. A promise which would ultimately cost Duke his life, motivating Falcon to become the Joe he was supposed to be. Hasbro was discontinuing Duke as a figure, so he was an obvious, easy target. Dead on the shelves, dead in the story. <laughs> As Hasbro saw it, if killing a character off in G.I. Joe was going to bring emotional weight and gravitas to their movie, then why not do it in the Transformers the movie as well? And the Transformers team could beat them to the punch. Contrary to the prevailing narrative, according to Buzz Dixon, of the three movies, My Little Pony was scheduled to be released first in 1986, with the Transformers second and G.I. Joe bringing up the rear. A few changes put Optimus Prime in the grave and passed on the mantle of leadership to the next wave of toys, a brilliant marketing plan. Until it wasn't. Care Bears 2, a new generation was released in March of 1986, continuing their winning streak at the box office. My Little Pony the movie was released in June, followed by the Transformers the movie in August. The audience reaction to Optimus Prime's death was not good. Kids were so distressed walking out of the theater saying things like, ah shit and damn it. Parents complained to Hasbro, compelling them to find a way to bring Optimus back to life and prominence in the franchise. Undo the trauma they had inflicted. Suddenly, everybody at Hasbro corporate was all wishy-washy about killing dudes in the kids' movies. Hasbro decided that Duke was not going to die after all. It wasn't too late to make a few creative adjustments to the scene where Duke dies from getting snaked in the heart. Scarlet, instead of making it very clear that he's dead by saying, he's gone, makes it very clear that he has gone into a coma by saying, 
He's gone into a coma. It's still very sad. Sad enough to make Hawk cry. But at least we know he's going to be okay. At the end of the movie, Doc is kind enough to call the team and all the toy-buying parents as they celebrate the defeat of Cobra La to let them know that Duke has come out of his coma and is going to be okay. This is Doc at headquarters. Great news. Oh, 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 oh. But G.I. Joe's future at the box office was hanging by a thread. On top of concerns about the response to Optimus Prime's death, both My Little Pony the movie and the Transformers the movie had grossly underperformed at the box office relative to the success still being enjoyed by the Care Bears. And suddenly, De Laurentiis Entertainment Group was all wishy-washy about the viability of G.I. Joe after a string of box office disappointments. Three of their first four films, Raw Deal, My Little Pony the Movie, Maximum Overdrive, and The Transformers the Movie, had broken even or lost money. The decision was made to release G.I. Joe the Movie direct to television and home video. It premiered April 18, 1987 as a five-part miniseries on TV and was released and was released on home video April 20th. Never, I should put a macro in there that never lets me put those two words together. <laughs> Together. <laughs> How do you write a macro? <laughs> Like Transformers, G.I. Joe had taken the appropriate steps to deliver box office success, and that included adding some star power to the cast. Falcon was played by Don Johnson, who was in the middle of a run as James Sonny Crockett on the hit TV series Miami Vice. It is our greater destiny which concerns me now. If I was a young fella like you, I'd be mounting every woman in Wabasha. Globulus was played by Hollywood legend Burgess Meredith. Sergeant Slaughter was back as himself. All of the regular TV series voice actors were back as well. And even Peter, out of the way, Hot Rod Cullen, alongside his nemesis Frank, I would have waited an eternity for this, Welker. Beyond the characters introduced in the film, there was no licensed merchandise exclusive to the film that we could find. The point was to sell the toys that were on the shelves and the new items coming to shelves. There was no Pizza Hut or KFC premiums, no G.I. Joe the Movie bedsheets. G.I. Joe the Movie was obviously released on home video in 1987. Rhino released it on DVD in 2000. In 2010, Shout Factory released a remastered special edition on DVD and followed that with a Blu-ray version as well. In June of 2022, 36 years after it was originally supposed to arrive in theaters, G.I. Joe the Movie arrived in theaters. Fathom Events offered a special presentation of G.I. Joe the Movie at theaters across the country, allowing both longtime and first-time fans to see it for the first time the way it was originally meant to be seen. Compared to the Transformers the Movie, G.I. Joe the Movie played as if it was the next miniseries in the order of battle. Kids were used to five-parters being epic television events that kicked off the new season of the show. While there was certainly excitement over the action, the Duke near-death experience, and the new Rawhides and Renegades members of the Joes, the fandom was split over the introduction of the heavily science fiction aspects of Cobra La. It was a seismic shift, a near betrayal of what many fans thought was the reality of the franchise's existence. Hard to verbalize that when you're 12 years old. What actually manifested was a closure of the storyline and a bunch of kids that moved on to other things. Hasbro itself moved on to other things by discontinuing production of new episodes after season two ended, then allowed Deacon entertainment to take over from Sunbow and Marvel Productions. G.I. Joe returned to television two years later in 1989. Any attempt to raise the stakes for a maturing audience was abandoned. The events of the movie acknowledged, then forgotten. Hasbro was back to positioning G.I. Joe for the younger kids and trying to find new ways to keep up with the new hotness, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Action features and neon colors took over as play features in place of camouflage and plausible military functionality. Not to mention a constantly shifting landscape of global injustices that G.I. Joe was called upon to thwart, everything from drug dealers to eco-terrorists. G.I. Joe was a changed brand and Hasbro's attitude toward it changed as well. The disappointing performance of the three Hasbro films meant that the fourth film, Gem and the Holograms, never got past the idea phase. The deep years of G.I. Joe never achieved the same level of popularity, producing 44 episodes over two seasons from 1989 to 1992 before giving way to a series of conceptual reboots. Like a snake to the heart, the movie, the series was a victim of timing and unforeseen circumstances. G.I. Joe the movie was a bridge to the next chapter of G.I. Joe and Hasbro, but a very different bridge to a very different chapter than they had anticipated just a few years before. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, if you would like early access to the videos ad-free, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy and let us know in the comments down below when you got into G.I. Joe. Did the movie help? Did Cobra Law hurt? My brother was into G.I. Joe before I was. For whatever reason, the military stuff just didn't catch my attention over He-Man. I didn't connect with it until they added animals. That was a whole new world for me. A global peacekeeper 
peacekeeping force that fought against terrorism but also really loved their pet friends and an organization that allowed them to bring them to work. <laughs> Just like this one. Oh, really? <laughs> I had no idea. Cut! <laughs>